Well, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you, Mahmoud, and thank you for the center for hosting me and all my friends that are, that are here. Um, it's great to speak in Ramallah. It's great to be in Palestine. I've been here about three weeks now, and it's been very busy. Uh, but probably the highlight of my trip, of this visit, had to be uh, driving yesterday with some people from Nabi Saleh to Ain Hijla. Whereas I'm sure many of you know, they, uh, this, this, this old, uh, old city outside of Jericho has been occupied by Palestinians, as well it deserves to be. And it was, uh, first of all, driving through all these extra checkpoints that have been put up by the army in order to stop people from coming, and then to see people pouring in anyway. I was there, we drove from Nabi Saleh, we got there sometime in the afternoon, there was still a lot of police and army, we managed to get in, and then more people came and more people came. When we arrived, there were probably three or four hundred people there. I stayed till midnight and then I snuck out and drove to Jerusalem. There must have been a thousand people there, I think. And this city that was deserted for all this time just came back to life, Palestinian flags and uh, young people reciting poetry and uh, singing songs and children playing. It was very, very moving. And I think it's an important statement. I think it was... Um, and another thing, you had people there from all of Palestine. I mean, groups that came from the north, from the south, from the center, from everywhere. And this was... Um, it was very positive. It was very principled. It was very well organized. Um, sadly, Israel doesn't see how important this is. Israel doesn't appreciate just how valuable it is to have people like that. So nobody knows how long they're going to be there, but the last, <clears throat> I spoke to some people before I came tonight, and they said that they're under siege now. The army has placed them under siege, so they can't get any more water or food or anything. I know some of the families left, because a lot of families came yesterday, which was very nice. Um, but I think this is one more very important step, and probably one in many, um, of Palestinians claiming their rights to Palestine and claiming their and demonstrating their very principled resistance uh, to the Israeli occupation of Palestine. And I think it's I think one of the one of the things that people find sometimes confusing about this issue is that it's really not clear what this issue is about and how to go about resolving it. And um, let's see, I'll use this. And I think, I, think, I think one important question is, is Israel, is, are, are Israel and Palestine two countries or one? Because the impression that many people have, especially on the outside, is that there's an Israel and there's a Palestine, and they just can't get along, so there's a war, and therefore we need to have peace talks. And for some reason, they can't seem to get the peace talks together because they're, you know, they just can't get along. And it's this absurd insistence on a reality that doesn't exist. Palestine and Israel is the same place. The conflict here is not about two countries at war, and the solution is not about is not about is not going to come about through a peace agreement. The, uh, the country is occupied and colonized, and you've got one side who is the colonizer, the oppressor, and it's a fight for freedom. And once people come to terms with that, they'll begin to understand that all this nonsense about peace talks has got nothing to do with the issue because it's not a question of two countries at war. It's a question of one country that is imposing its will on another nation. And hopefully, and I think, see, you know, living in the US as I do, I see some change in people realizing that Zionism needs to be treated just like apartheid was treated in South Africa. And the conversation needs to be about the struggle against Zionism and ending Zionism so that there will no longer be oppression, there will be a real, there will be an ability for people to live here like normal people as equals. Um, just like apartheid had to go before there was a chance for equality in South Africa. So I think this is a very, very important change that has to take place. And I think it's important to say these things, although for some people find it very difficult. And again, being in a French-German center 75 years ago, if somebody would have suggested that there would be a French-German center, you know, people would have thought you're crazy. And here we are today taking it for granted. Oh, yes, it's a French-German center. Of course, why not? So I think um, 
not just imagining, but understanding that a Pal Israeli-Palestinian reality, an Israeli-Palestinian uh, joint reality, living together as normal people do, um, is certainly within our reach and certainly uh, something that we need to treat as, as a reality that's about to unfold. Um, now, of course, many people understand that there is a... Um, there's a serious disagreement between the two sides on the origins of the conflict. And this disagreement, as I'm sure many of you know, is not on small details, but it's about the very essence of the beginning of the conflict. You know, Ilan Pape talks about something very interesting. He, he, he describes this reality where when the early Zionist immigrants came at the end of the... Uh, uh, 1900s, or at the end of the, the end of 19th century, um, they saw the Palestinians who were who lived on the land as aliens and invaders. Even so, these new immigrants looked at the Palestinians who were living here in Palestine, and they treated them and they saw described them as alien invaders. So this misunderstanding or this or this. Um, well, misunderstanding and, 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 uh, and difference in how we see the origins of the conflict is, is very deep. But I think a good time to start talking about it is exactly on the 29th of November, 1947. Because that demonstrates, I think, the misunderstanding that the world chose to adopt. So on that day, the United Nations decided to partition Palestine. And they decided to take an approach which was very superficial and very simple to uh, an issue that is very complex. And of course, when we, st when we try to take complex issues and make them simple, we get in trouble. So the issue was, well, the Arabs want the land, the Jews want the land, we'll give them a piece, we'll give them a piece, and everything will be fine. Except that's not how it works. And again, one big piece of the puzzle that people often forget to mention or forget to talk about is that when the United Nations decided to do this, there were only about half a million Jews living in Palestine and close to a million and a half Palestinian Arabs living in Palestine. So the very notion that you can just cut the country in half and give each part a piece is absurd. Not to mention the fact that the United Nations decided to give the larger piece to the smaller community, which is even more absurd. And this small Jewish community, who were they? These were my grandparents' generation who immigrated, and then my parents who were born here. So basically people who almost just came off the boat. So they are suddenly given, by someone who has no right to give, but given the larger portion of a country that they of course don't own. And then from this point on, you have two stories of course that are completely the opposite, that go in completely different directions. Now the problem is that when you have two claims to the history, and these claims are so far apart, only one of them can be true. If you have small differences on detail, then you can say, well, maybe there's a bit of truth in both of them. But when you have two stories that are diametrically opposed, then really that only leaves the possibility of one being true. So as an Israeli, what I learned, and of course what is taught in America as well, and in much of the West, is that the Jewish community accepted the partition resolution, even though the Jewish community deserved the entire country. We were generous and we accepted just a part of it. Then the Arabs attacked. And why did the Arabs attack? Well, the Arabs attacked because they hate Jews and everybody hates Jews, and so the Arabs attacked. And they attacked because they wanted to destroy us. And very for we were very fortunate that we were a little bit smarter than they and a little more uh, developed than they were. And of course we had a, you know, a group of young, brave men who fought very well. And within 12 months, we defeated the Arabs, we conquered the country, almost all of it, and we established the Jewish state for the first time after 2,000 years in the land of Israel. It sounds almost biblical. I mean, how can you possibly argue with a story that's so powerful? Particularly if, you know, you're born into this. So much of what it means to be an Israeli has to do with that story. That story that we the descendants of King David who defeated Goliath. And we, the descendants of the Maccabees who defended, you know, who fought big empires and, and, and won. 
now once again, the, we defeated the Arabs and we won and we were and so on. So this is a very powerful story. Of course, in my case, my father was an officer in that, uh, on, on, in the Jewish militia and the Zionist militia. So it's a very powerful story and it's very hard to refute and it's very easy to teach. So in America, when they teach this to children, it sounds very good. And, and there is a connection made between little King da little David who defeated Goliath and Israel and Zionism today. A very clear line is drawn between these. Even though there is no historical proof that there was a King David, but that's a whole other story. Then we start looking at the details. And then we start looking at the complexity of the story. And we find that in 1947, while the Zionist militia was very strong, about 40,000 well-trained armed men, there was no equivalent on the Palestinian side. So if there was no equivalent and there was no real militia and there was no real armed force, who are these Arabs that attack the Jews? So we know other Arab armies intervened in Palestine later on, but that was much later. That was six, seven months later. So what happened here? <clears throat> if you didn't have a Palestinian militia, if you didn't have a Palestinian fighting force, not a, not a large one anyway, then who are these Arabs that attacked? And then you have to look deeper and you say, well, actually, that's not what happened at all. Actually, what happened was, after the United Nations gave its approval for the creation of a Jewish state, the Zionist militia began a massive campaign of conquest, ethnic cleansing, and destruction and terrorism. Basically a campaign of terrorism that lasted 12 months. An armed militia fighting an unarmed civilian population. At the end of which, hundreds and hundreds of towns and cities were destroyed, leveled to the ground. Close to a million or somewhere between 800,000 and a million civilians forced out of their homes and out of their country. And the land of Israel was conquered by the Jews and the Jewish state was established. So now it's not so romantic, it's not so heroic, it's not so biblical, but now the story makes sense. The pieces fit the puzzle. But I think this is such a, a it's, there's such a big difference between these two stories that when you come from the Israeli side and you try to see the other side, it's absolutely absurd. It makes, it's a very, very difficult process. Now, one of the claims that's made, and I think most people here, this is not going to come as news to you, but one of the claims that's made is that perhaps, perhaps a few villages were destroyed, and perhaps a few people were forced to leave. But really, there was nothing there. I mean, most of Palestine were, you know, Bedouins with camels, and uh, maybe small little towns, and there was really nothing significant. There was, you know, any advancement that came, any development that came, came with the Zionists. So I like to show this picture of the city of Jaffa before 1948. And as I'm sure many of you know, the city of Jaffa before 1948 was a city of almost 120,000 people. With concert halls, <clears throat> and movie theaters, and several newspapers, and trade unions, and writers' unions, and, and a rich business life and a political life. And it was a major Arab city on the coast of the Mediterranean, before 1948. And then in a matter of two weeks in 1948, this city of close to 120,000 was reduced to less than 4,000. All concentrated in one neighborhood with barbed wire and Israeli soldiers surrounding them. And if we look at this very spot today, from this very angle, what do we see? The city of Tel Aviv. So Yaffa was a large Arab city with a, with, a, with a Jewish neighborhood, with some Jewish presence, and of course Tel Aviv is a major Israeli city with a very small but very neglected and oppressed Palestinian community that's very much alive, but is very much... Uh, forced to live under, under very difficult conditions. So when there's talk about there's really nothing there and there was no Palestine, of course it's complete nonsense. Now what, one of the things I like to tell my Palestinian friends is the first time I heard the word Nakba, or the idea that 1948 was called a Nakba, I was, I was insulted. 1948, for Israelis, is, like I said, it's almost biblical. It's almost miraculous. The revival of the Jewish people and the creation of the Jewish state in the, in the land of Israel and so on. 
and somebody could call it a catastrophe. This is, this is a gap that's hard to bridge, that's, that's really difficult to bridge. And then I began learning and understanding why it is called a Nakba and why it was a Nakba, why it was a catastrophe. But I think now what's important to stress is that the catastrophe, the Nakba, didn't happen in 1948. There was a process that began in 1948 and goes on today. So for the last almost seven decades, there has been a process of destruction, catastrophic destruction, that continues to this very day. And over four million refugees living in refugee camps is certainly a sign of that. And I took this picture just last January. And these children probably live an hour, two-hour drive from major cities here in Israel, in Palestine, where you wouldn't dream of seeing children like this where you wouldn't dream of seeing people live without water, electricity, sewage, access to health care. You know, we think of big things, but you know, what does it mean to have access to health care? When a child has an ear infection and you can't find a doctor, you, there's no antibiotics. You don't have to think any farther than that. Now again, this is not in sub-Saharan Africa or in Afghanistan. This is an hour, two hours drive from maybe here the major cities with the best hospitals and you wouldn't, again, you wouldn't dream of seeing Israeli children like, live, live anywhere here like this without electricity, running water, and so on. So this is the catastrophe. The catastrophe is that even today, even under our watch, this continues. This continues. And again, it's so close to places, probably the very places where their grandparents had to, were forced to leave. And every time people start thinking about, you know, uh, any kind of uh, equivalence between the two sides, I think this is a picture that has to come up. Why is this being allowed? Why, are Palestinian, why do Palestinian children have to live like this and grow up like this? And again, when we think, think about this attempt, this ongoing attempt to reduce Palestine to the West Bank or the West Bank and Gaza, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's something that Israel has been driving for a very long time. And I think it's important to remind people that you cannot reduce Palestine to the West Bank and Gaza. Because Palestine exists in Yaffa, and it exists in the Negev Desert, and it exists in the Galilee, and it exists in other places. And any attempt to try and reduce it, of course, will fail, as all the attempts have failed so far. And these children have a right to go home. Their families have a right to go back to the places from which they were, they, they were forced to leave. Now, <clears throat> people often ask, people often ask me, you know, how, when did you start, when did you change? Because I grew up as a very proud patriotic Zionist. So people often ask, well, how did it begin, and so on. And this is a picture of my mother when she was very young. She's probably 22, 23 years old. And, and I talk about this in the book. This is the story that she told me many, many times as I was growing up. And the story has to do with her experience in 1948. Now, she was born and raised in Jerusalem. She's 87 years old now. She still lives in Jerusalem. And the story was that in 1948, when the Zionist forces came and took the neighborhoods, now I'm talking about not the old city of Jerusalem, I'm talking about the neighborhoods outside of the old city of Jerusalem, um, in the neighborhoods in the side of Jerusalem that became Israel. And the Zionist forces took these neighborhoods, they forced the Palestinians out, and the homes were available, became available, and they were made available to Israeli families. And Israeli families were offered these homes, and my mother was offered one of these homes. She was living in a small apartment with her mother, with her parents, and she was already a mother herself. And the way she tells the story, the way she, the emotion that she expresses every time she tells the story, even when we talk about this today, is the exact same emotion. How could I possibly take the home of another family? How can I possibly move into the home of another mother? And then she always describes that when the soldiers came in, the coffee was still warm on the table. And then they brought the trucks and they started the looting. Because these are, if you know the homes in these neighborhoods, I'm sure some of you do, these are beautiful homes. These are well-to-do families. So the rugs and the furniture was all taken. And, and there's a, a documentary that came out maybe a year ago about the books that were stolen. The Zionist forces had a unit of librarians that followed the forces from house to house and stole rare books that are now in the Hebrew University, in the, in the library. They were that organized. 
So anyway, so she went on to describe the story and how she refused to take the home and so on. And it's a wonderful story, but there was something about the story that bothered me for many, many years. In fact, until I wrote the book, I couldn't quite come to terms with what it was that was bothering me about the story. There was, some, there was a problem with the story. And as I was working on the book, I realized the problem with the story is that it contradicts the national narrative. The Zionist narrative is perfect. It's impeccable. It is morally perfect. We deserve the entire country, but we agreed to take less. We were attacked, and thankfully we were victorious. We asked the Palestinians to stay, and they left, which is a big part of the story. We asked them to stay, and they left anyway. So we have no responsibility towards the fact that there are the refugees out there. Now, if all of this is true, <clears throat> If all of this is true, then there's no moral dilemma with taking the house. If people left on their own and left the house, well, and there's a family that needs a home, there's no moral dilemma here. And why was she, she was presenting a moral dilemma, which of course took me a very long time to understand. And in fact, talking about the, 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 the Zionist narrative is so perfect, morally, that even when the Zionists do admit to committing atrocities, there's somehow... A happy ending. So I remember as a child learning about Dir Yassin, the massacre of Dir Yassin. If you don't know, it was a village on the outskirts of Jerusalem. They surrendered. The forces came in and committed a terrible massacre. So we learned that it was a terrible thing because you know women and children and civilians were killed. At the same time, as a result of the Dir Yassin massacre, hundreds of thousands of Arabs left which allowed us to create a Jewish majority. And we all know, and again we, I mean Israeli children, we all know that there's really nothing more important than creating a Jewish majority in Israel. So even though there was a terrible thing that happened, there was somehow a good outcome. So if we bombard Gaza and we kill civilians, we do it because, well, Hamas is a threat, and so there's a good thing, because now our towns and our cities are safer and so on and so on. So the, the Zionist narrative is always perfect morally. And again, she was poking holes at this narrative, which as a child, I remember, was a very difficult thing for me to understand. I won't get in too much, too, you know, too much into the, the, the wars and the history. I think most of you probably know all about it. But this is what the map looked like between 1948 and 1967. Once again, 1967, we hear that Israel was under an existential threat. Thankfully, the Israeli forces were smart and well-trained, and because Israel was under an existential threat, they had no choice but to engage in a preemptive strike in which they easily uh, defeated the Arab armies. Once again, the David and Goliath story continues. And in one of the things that I did as I was working on the book, um, being that it's the general son, I wanted to learn as much as possible about my father's career. I went into the Israeli army archives, and one of the most interesting aspects, one of the most interesting things that I was able to see were the minutes of the meetings of the Israeli high command before the war of 1967, and the, the weeks and the days leading up to the war. Now, I'm not the first one to see them. People have written books about these, uh, about these meetings, about who said what, which general said this, which general said that, but there was one thing I had not seen before. And it's something that my father says and the other generals repeat. And that is that the Arab armies are not prepared for war. We therefore have an opportunity now to attack and destroy the Arab armies, particularly the Egyptian army, because the other Arab, Arab armies were even less prepared than the Egyptians. Well, this is news. So what about the existential threat? What about the existential threat? Not a single word about a threat. Never mind an existential threat. Not a single word about a threat. They talk about an opportunity and how to push the Israeli cabinet to finally give them the approval to engage in a preemptive strike. That's all they talked about. Then, after the war was over, they congratulated themselves for what they called finishing the job particularly when it comes to Palestine. I mean, they conquered areas outside of Palestine, but particularly in Palestine, everything in the West Bank. They finished the job of 1948. 
they finished the conquest of Palestine, of the land of Israel. <coughs> so once again, when people try to reduce the issue of Palestine to the West Bank, and when people try to talk about the possibility of some imaginary Israeli government that will one day allow a Palestinian state to emerge, it's fiction. It's mythology. It's trying to believe in something that didn't exist ever and will never exist. Because the basic idea of Zionism is that the land belongs to the Jews. And this idea was executed very well by the Israeli army between 1948 and 1967. And in 1967, they finished the job. They conquered it all. They wanted the water. They wanted the land. They wanted the cities. They wanted it all. And as far as they're concerned, the job was complete. In fact, what they did was they created a single state over all of Palestine, which is what they wanted to do to begin with, with exclusive rights for Jewish people. The ridiculous thing is that they call it a Jewish state. Why is it ridiculous? Most Jews don't live here. And never will. Half the people who do live here, in fact, more than half, of the people who do live here are not Jewish. According to statistics that came out of the, the Israeli Prime Minister's office, out of 12 million people here, 5.9 are Israeli Jews. Well, do the math. So not only do most Jews not live here, half the population, or more than half, are not Jewish. So how is this exactly a Jewish state? Again, it's this mythology, it's this, it's this fictional idea of an existence that really is not, is not real. And any attempts to try to, 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 to develop an idea that somehow there will be one day a liberal <coughs> Israeli prime minister who will allow the Palestinians to establish a state in the West Bank or anywhere in Palestine is absolutely absurd. And it contradicts everything we've seen over the last seven decades, particularly since Oslo, and particularly since Oslo. And I think, again, it's important to come to terms with that. But the reason there is no peace is because Israel doesn't want peace. Israel is, is doesn't want peace because Israel thinks there's no problem. The only way to move forward beyond the, the reality that exists today is to fight Zionism and end Zionism like apartheid was ended. Which, again, for some people, is a very hard thing to say. Uh, this is a picture of my father, the general. But I'm going to move on to something else. This whole issue of peace, you know, now again, people will still talk about Kerry, even though the Israeli cabinet, cabinet members are making jokes about Kerry publicly and humiliating him publicly. And it's hard to blame them because he is, he, he's on this fool's errand. It's hard to imagine why somebody like him would take on this, 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 um, this, this peace, peace talks thing. When we look at the history of this, of this idea of the peace talks, we can see over and over again why it's absurd. After the 1967 war, my father and several other Israeli, prominent Israelis, said, okay, we must make peace with the Palestinians. We must allow the Palestinians to establish a state. That's when the two-state solution idea emerged, as, as we know it today. This was in the early 70s. And then they began, the PLO, members of the PLO, Yasser Arafat's people, began a dialogue with these people a discussion with these people. My father and Uri Avneri and others, they would meet in Europe, they would meet in North Africa, and these were Yasser Arafat's top people. And they, whenever they would return from these meetings, my father and the others would always report to the Israeli cabinet. They would always go back and report to the prime minister. Israel wanted nothing to do with it. In the 80s, they met with Arafat, Yasser Arafat in Tunis, a very high, highly publicized meeting with, with pictures and everything. Shortly after that, the Israeli cabinet approved a law that made it illegal for these meetings to continue. This is a law that was initiated by Shimon Peres, by the way, that made it illegal for these talks to continue. Of course, they said, arrest us, we're not going to stop. And then suddenly 1993 came around and we had peace talks, and we had Oslo. And it's Hakur Bin, who really should have been put on trial in The Hague for his war crimes, was now signing this peace deal with Yasser Arafat. And many people thought the world was changing because apartheid was falling, the Berlin Wall was falling, the Soviet Union was falling. Everybody, many people thought you know, this was maybe the beginning of something. What people don't realize, though, and some people did, Edward Said did, and my father did as well, is that the Oslo 
Accords were an attempt to bring the Palestinians to surrender, not to begin a peace process. By 1993, there was no longer a possibility for a Palestinian state to ever em to emerge. The West Bank was fully integrated with Israel. It was already too late, which is exactly why they agreed to bring Yasser Arafat back to Palestine to get him to sign a surrender. And because he refused, of course, we're still in this in this in this situation. And then in the year 2000, they tried again with Bill Clinton and Camp the second in the Camp David um, the summit. And they came out, you know, many people thought, this is the end, this is really it, they're going to sign the deal, they're going to sign the deal, and they came out. And Bill Clinton said, well, Palestinians gave some, but the Israelis gave more. In other words, the Palestinians were accused of not making concessions. The Palestinians who agreed to give up 80% of their homeland, agreed to give up the right of return, agreed to recognize the very state that destroyed Palestine and made peace with this very state, they were accused of not making concessions. And everybody bought this. When in fact, the Palestinian stance was probably the most consistent stance for peace. Yasser Arafat was probably the most consistent voice for peace from between the mid-1970s and then when he died in 2004, for 30 years. The idea of the two-state solution is something he agreed to as long as it is the full West Bank with East Jerusalem, without settlement, in Gaza, of course. Well, Israel's not interested. It wasn't interested. It's still not interested. And that's why it's falling apart. That's why there's no chance. That's why it's not happening. Um, another issue that I think has to be talked about when we talk about Palestine, and again, for many of you, I know this is an issue that uh, you know a lot about, uh, is the issue of the Palestinian prisoners and the issue of the Palestinian resistance. You cannot have a serious discussion on the issue of Palestine without talking about the Palestinian prisoners. In case there's anybody here who doesn't know, you'd be hard, you, it's almost impossible to meet a Palestinian or to talk to anybody, a Palestinian, without either he or she having been in prison or a loved one has, either is or has been in prison. And of course, Israel calls them terrorists. And I think it's important to see two things in, in that light. The first one is that according to an Israeli sociologist, an Israeli research, the vast majority of Palestinian prisoners in jail have not been charged with acts of violence. I'll say it again. The vast majority of Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails have not been charged with acts of violence. And this is even by the very low bar of the Israeli judicial system or the Israeli military judicial system. And I think this is a reflection on the Palestinian resistance, which by and large has always been largely unarmed resistance. The armed resistance always gets all the attention, but the vast majority of Palestinian resistance has and still is unarmed and principled. The other thing that people often forget to realize is that there's a United Nations resolution that, a resolution that recognizes the right of people to resist. The world community recognizes the, the, the rights of people to resist. The struggle of people under colonial and alien domination and racist regimes, which is exactly what Israel is, almost by its own definition. It's an alien domination, it's racist, and it's colonial. <clears throat> so the struggle against that for the implementation of the right to self-determination and independence is legitimate. It is acceptable according to international law. So again, when we talk about Palestinian resistance, we're talking about the right of people to fight for their freedom. And in the context of what I said earlier, the whole idea of peace talks in order to resolve this issue is absurd. What is required here is a, cons is a, is a focused, concentrated effort to topple the oppressive regime that exists here, the non-democratic oppressive regime, which is what Zionism is. Just like the world stood behind the fight against apartheid, the world needs to stand behind the fight against Zionism in order to create a real democracy here. And of course, the, the, the work and the principal leadership of the Palestinian prisoners is something that is, I don't know that, it's, that there's anything similar to it any, in any other nation. And I talk about it, I was very fortunate, I've got some great friends who are former prisoners, 
and the work that they've done and the process that they went through in the prisons and the entire prisoners' movement. I talk about it quite a bit, quite a bit in my book because I was, I think, privileged to meet some of these wonderful principled people who, again, are imprisoned not because they're criminals, they're imprisoned because they are principled leaders of a resistance movement. Once again, I'll go back to this question that I'm often asked, you know, what brought about the change in, in me as a patriotic Israeli in order, you know, moving forward and becoming an activist and so on and talking about this issue. And I'm sure, as many of you know, because many of you know me, uh, in 1997, my sister's daughter was killed in a suicide attack in Jerusalem. Uh, I was living in the U.S. at the time already. And, uh, of course, when I heard, I took the first plane home. By the time I reached my sister's apartment in Jerusalem, it was packed with both Israelis and Palestinians who came to mourn, but also reporters, because here is the granddaughter of a very well-known general who was the victim of terrorism. And not only that, but this general was also a voice for peace. He became an advocate for Palestinian rights, which is even, you know, even a bigger story. And when my sister Nurit finally came out to talk to everybody, the press and so on, the questions that come up are, first of all, about revenge and retaliation, and then, of course, who's responsible. And her response was, first of all, don't talk to me about revenge and retaliation. She said, no real mother would want to see this happen to any other mother. No real mother would want to see another mother mourn like this. And the absurdity of killing people in response to somebody's death. It's sickening. And she quoted a line from a Hebrew poet, Bialik, who, who wrote that even the devil himself, even the devil himself can't come up with a vengeance that's appropriate for the death of a child. Would you do kill a thousand people, a million people? That's an absurd idea. And in terms of who's responsible, she said, well, let's take a look. Who has stolen Palestinian land? Who is destroying Palestinians' homes? Who is depriving Palestinians from their water and their rights? Who is shooting Palestinian children in their schools? Who is bombing Palestinian refugee camps from the air? And both she and her husband, my brother-in-law Rami, both said they hold the Israeli government directly responsible for their daughter's death because it's the Israeli policies against the Palestinians which bring about the resistance. And she said, what do we expect? Do we really expect that nothing like this will happen? Every time as Israelis, when we say we want peace, but we elect people like Netanyahu and Sharon and Lieberman and all these other people, what do we expect? So, of course, this became even bigger news because now we have an Israeli bereaved mother who's turned the world upside down. We know the Palestinians are terrorists, the Israelis are victims. We know Israelis want peace and Palestinians are, you know, won't compromise. Suddenly, this bereaved Israeli mother is turning everything upside down. So it had a huge impact on everybody, but it also had a huge impact on me. And I went back to the United States looking for something to do. You can't just brush it off. You can't pretend like nothing happened after something like this. And I was very fortunate because in the United States, I was able to meet and begin a, and join a Palestinian, a Jewish Palestinian discussion group. And let me tell you, I was born and raised in Jerusalem. I'm at 20 minutes, well, it should be 20 minute drive from here. Mm -hmm two and a half hour drive that should be a 20 minute drive from here and I never met Palestinians I mean I saw Palestinians but Jerusalem is such a segregated city it's such a racist city I never met Palestinians the first time and I talk about the book the, 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 the first sentence in the chapter that talks about the journey says that my journey into Palestine began in San Diego I was 39 years old and in a very, and I have to say, in a very generous and gracious way, this Palestinian community, these people who became my friends, took me by the hand and led me through this very, very long and painful and difficult process of, first of all, realizing that there's another story. That there are people here that live in the same country and I never met. They're my neighbors. That there's a country here that I didn't know existed and it's called Palestine, even though I was born and raised in this country. And there's an entire wealth of, 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 of culture and existence I knew nothing about, even though 
it happened literally next door to me. And then to take the next step, and that is even more painful, then realize that if these two stories are so are contradicting and only one of them can be true, then realizing the one that I was raised upon and I felt myself so much part of, or was so much a part of me, is not true. It's like taking a saw and cutting off your arm without anesthesia very slowly. It's a very long and very difficult and very painful process. But it's also very liberating. And the big danger when you start engaging with the other side, so to speak, is that instead of fear, you develop trust. So very gradually the fear goes away and trust takes its place. And when that happens, it's over. That's why I say it's a very dangerous thing because the walls come down, the differences disappear. And all you see is people that you care for, that you trust, that you can live with, that you can work with, that you become your friends. And when the fear disappears and the trust that takes over, then, <coughs> like I said, it could be a very dangerous thing. That's why we have a wall. That's why at every checkpoint there's a massive sign that warns Israelis that if they cross or if they keep driving along this route, this, uh, this road, first of all, it's a felony, but it's also life-threatening. I don't know how many times I've, cro I've, I've crossed those signs, and every time I cross it, and nothing happens. <laughs> you cross it again, and nothing happens. Nobody even seems to mind that I, or care that I'm here or that I'm there. You know? But that's the process. You need the soldiers, you need the wall, you need the signs to keep the fear. Because God forbid, if trust takes over, then it's over. Then there's no reason to have this mythical, really strange idea of a Jewish state. <coughs> then you can have a democracy, then you can have equal rights, then you can, Palestinians can have just as much water as Israelis, and just the same rights, and so on. You can have a Palestinian prime minister, and it's not going to be the end of the world. So to keep from Israelis from realizing this, you need the wall and the soldiers, and, you know, I don't know how many billions of dollars worth of weapons coming into this country every year, even though this country has no security for it. When you go to Bilin or Nabisar after the protest and you get shot, it's not because you're a security threat. When they dropped hundreds of tons of bombs on Gaza, it's not because it's a security threat. It's not because Hamas is a security threat. Because before it was Hamas, it was something else. And they were still dropping bombs. It's to keep the fear alive, to keep the conflict alive. It's a, it's a very racist, very militant ideology that governs, that runs that fuels Zionism, which is why, of course, we have to end it. And then, of course, the million dollar question, which I think is a very simple, has a very simple answer. Do we continue and allow this one state that Israel uh, created here, that has exclusive rights for Jewish people, or do we fight or struggle to transform it into a real democracy with equal rights? So it's not one state or two states. It's one state, except will it be a democracy or not, is the question. The question one state, two state is an absurd question. It's assuming that there could be one day an Israeli government that will allow the Palestinians to establish a state on the land of Israel. It's an impossibility logically. How could you allow a Palestinian state on the land of Israel when you believe this is the land of Israel, the land of the Jews? You have to get rid of the ideology, you have to get rid of the, of the, of the racist uh, state and then establish a real democracy. Now, this is, we were not trying to invent the wheel. This is not the first time it's happened. We've seen racist and, and, and dictatorship and, 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 and tyrant dictators go by the, by the wayside many, many times, <laughs> at least my lifetime, and I'm, you know, I'm 52. And most of them were done peacefully. So to assume that it's either this reality that exists today, or some mythical reality where Israel will allow the Palestinians their own state, is, 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 is it's, it's no wonder there's such little, so little hope here. You have to get rid of this notion of Israel. We have to get rid of, of this apartheid ideology, which is what Zionism is, in favor of a democracy.
again, look at South Africa. A year, two years before the clerk made that, that historical statement where he said, Nelson Mandela will be released unconditionally. And everybody knew that that was the end of apartheid. A year or two years before that, if you suggested that that statement was going to be made, you'd be put in asylum probably. It was uh, impossible. The same thing with the Berlin Wall, fall, uh, Berlin Wall falling, and the same thing with dictatorships in Latin America. They were all supported by, by the United States, including South, uh, apartheid in South Africa. They all had the power, and yet they're all history. And I think what's important to realize here, the question that always comes up when I say this is, yes, but Israelis will never agree. If we waited for the whites in South Africa to agree, Nelson Mandela would have died in jail. And there would still be an apartheid regime in South Africa. No privileged groups ever agree. They are forced into it. And then they wake up in the morning and they say, well, you know what? We can live with this. It's not the end of the world. That's the reality. Now, is this identical to South Africa or to any other place? Of course not. It's not identical. The chances for success in Palestine are far greater than any other place in the world. You have two societies that are highly educated, two societies that are highly productive, two societies that have traditions of, of, govern of, of, of governing in, 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 you know, through, through democratic, more or less democratic means. You have two societies that are actually very similar. Most Israelis are actually Arabs. Because most Israelis are the, are the children and grandchildren of Jews who came from Arab countries. And they'll still say, yeah, we're Iraqis, or we're Moroccans, or we're Yemenites. They'll still say it today, even though they're three generations since, since their, their parents, their grandparents came here. So most Israelis are actually Arabs. So even culturally, I mean, the differences are very small. Two religions that are actually very similar, or three religions that are very similar, but you know, mostly, uh, mostly Jews and Muslims. And two religions that have a history of, working, of living together in peace in the Middle East. Jews and Muslims. So it's all a question of how we frame this picture and how we frame this reality. Now, probably the most common comment that I get from my lectures and from my book is that I'm, that, you know, it, it's hopeful. But I think this hope is, is, is based, you know, how, the reason I am hopeful is because it's based on, on what we see on the ground. Besides the moral issue, this reality is not sustainable. We already, there's already a, a, a non-Jewish majority, a Palestinian majority in this country. By 2020, Gaza alone, by 2020, in Gaza alone, there will be another 500,000 people. This is according to a UN report that came out last, last summer. So are they still going to have to rely on tunnels to bring in food and medicine and clean water? Even though they live a 10-minute drive from cities that have supermarkets and electricity and, and, and medicine? Two million people living in a reality like this next door to a completely modern state, developed state. This is not sustainable, besides being morally absurd. So I think if we take a look at how this is going to happen, which is the next question that comes up, we see that there is massive change taking place that I see in the United States. University campuses, the pro-Palestinian voice is very strong. And it's fighting a tough battle against the Israeli lobby, against the Israeli Hasbara, against all these different things, and they're winning. The Palestinian voice is getting stronger. On campuses all the time, every year. More events, more events, more thousands and thousands of students being educated and learning this, that there's another perspective here. The BDS movement is growing. The movement to boycott and impose, you know, divest and impose sanctions on Israel is growing and getting more and more successes. And with every success, it becomes stronger. Five years ago, if you said BDS in America, people would say what? Today, everybody knows what BDS is. Every audience I speak to, they know what BDS is. You have churches, churches in America that five, six years ago were always behind Israel, are now passing divestment resolutions against Israel, boycott resolutions against Israel, coming to Palestine to support Palestinians. More and more churches. And of course here we see that there's a, what I think is probably an un, uh, unprecedented in terms of its uh, of principle is the resistance here in Palestine. The popular resistance in Palestine. It 
it's principled, it's dedicated, and all of these three aspects, the BDS, the, 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 the movements in, in the United States, and the popular resistance here, like we see now in, in, uh, in Anhejla, is never giving up, and is undefeatable. It doesn't matter how many nuclear weapons Israel has, this is not a battle they can win. And I think, and the last thing I'll say tonight is, I think certain generations are judged by certain issues. I'm talking about post-war, post, you know, World War II. In the 60s, it was civil rights in America. The 80s, it was apartheid in South Africa. Now, this, Palestine is the issue. All of us are going to be judged on this issue. Where did you stand on this issue? Our children, our grandchildren, they're already asking, they'll ask more. Where were you on this issue? Because this is a very clear moral issue. The Palestinian cause is a very clear moral issue. You can't say, well, yeah, a little bit of racism is okay, but only this much racism, but not that much racism. You're either against racism or you're a racist. There is no middle ground. On some issues, there is no gray area, there is no middle ground. And this is this issue. And I think it's very important for people to get on this and stand behind this firmly and turn this into the exact same as it's already happening, but support this as an anti-apartheid movement, which is what it's becoming. Except instead of the word apartheid, we need to put the word Zionism so people understand what we're talking about. Because when we say apartheid, they say, well, yes, but it's not exactly apartheid. It's not exactly like in South Africa. Fine, cross out the word apartheid and put the anti-Zionist movement. And that's what this has to be. And then when this does take place, and there is this transformation into a democracy, then Israelis and Palestinians will be able to live like normal people. This is a beautiful country, as I'm sure many all of you know. This is a country with, a, with, with endless potential. And I think there is a future, a very bright future, for Israelis and Palestinians, as long as we, as long as we fight for, for, for real democracy and equal rights. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mikos, uh, very much to end in a very hopeful note. I'm sure we have uh, questions from the audience. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Thank you. And uh, being born in Jaffa myself, I was glad to see Jaffa. Uh, the, my question is, of course, uh, uh, I, I commend you for, for your stand, for the way you have changed, for the courage you have taken to take the step. My question is, are you being able to have a dent in your own uh, community in, in Israel? And how are you able to do it? My comments are similar. I agree that uh, it's a wonderful presentation. Um, my question is, you said it was like cutting your arm off. It was a slow process, and then when you talked about the hope, you mentioned the Americans, the American religious society, you know, the churches, which is great, I'm happy, but again, I'm asking, uh, what hope do you see with the young Israeli um, upcoming adults? Is our teachers teaching anything in schools, for example, um, young children? I'm very glad that I'm here tonight. And I'm very glad to meet you. Thank you. Actually, I'll get a message from California to come here. Oh, that right? <laughs> from a friend in California. Okay. And I'm very glad that we stopped on this slide. Number one would take place, which is one state with exclusive rights for Jewish people. How long do you think that will last? And. If we do have, and I don't think that we can ever have one democratic state with equal rights. <clears throat> I don't know how you can see it. And if you don't mind, uh, it just happened because I was in a meeting with some friends in Tel Aviv a week ago. 
and we were discussing, of course, we breathe politics anyway. And I was shocked by a statement of one of the Israelis that, and we were talking about the Jewish state, which Netanyahu is asking for. And I said, well, we probably can convince Abu Mazen to agree <clears throat> on a Jewish state. If you agree to have Palestine as an Islamic state, And his answer was really shocking to me. He said, no, we Jews are a race. It's not a religion. Now, two minutes ago, you said Jews and Muslims, if you notice yourself, right? I was shocked when I heard that. So, and he's a very, very good friend to Netanyahu, by the way, who said that. He said, we are a race. So I asked him what my race is, and he said, you're an Arab. And these people are very close to Netanyahu, consultants of him, or for him. And they're thinking this way. Well, if you want to go pre-biblical way of thinking, then we are Canaan's, aren't we? So give me the Canaan country yeah. that goes up to Damascus, right? As a map. Well, anyway. I, so let me ask you just maybe if you could just add one more thing. Why do you think uh, democracy is impossible? That could be a hard answer for you as, as, as an Israeli. But I don't think you can practice it right. Me? With us, no. Oh, Israelis? The people, yes, the people that are living in Israel. Especially after the Intifada number two. You see, we, we have a saying in Arabic. It says, That means the knife hits the feathers of the chicken. Okay. So it didn't really hurt much. And I always call that in Intifada number one. But number two, Intifada number two, you guys broke the bones. And when you broke the bones, it's very hard. It, 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 it went, the, the wound is very deep now. On the Palestinian wound side. Between, yes, between both nations. Okay. I don't want to be hard on you. No, go right ahead. I'm, I'm fine with you. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> so are you a race? I would like to hear that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, the, um, the the questions about the questions about Israel and, uh, and the fact that um, you know the, the the thought that we need to somehow spend time convincing Israelis. It's true that you have to have some kind of, there has to be some engagement. At the same time, Israelis will never be convinced. Just like the whites in South Africa would have never been convinced. Just like the whites in the, in, in, you know, in the southern states in the U.S. would have never been convinced that they need to give up the privilege. Nobody is ever convinced that they have to give up, that they should give up the privilege. They are forced into it. I think Israelis are very fortunate that the, that the um, larger portion of the Palestinian resistance is unarmed resistance, particularly today. It's very principled. I think it's very effective. I think when we look again at the BDS and the movements around the world and the pro-Palestinian voice around the world and, and, the, and the popular resistance in Palestine, it's very effective. I think it's even more effective than what they realize. So Israel is not going to be convinced. Israel is going to wake up one morning like the whites in South Africa and there will be an Israeli prime minister and it could well be this, uh, this one who says the prisoners will be released unconditionally. Free and fair elections will take place within X amount of time. 
and this is going to be a democracy, and, and this is going to be the state of all of its people. But not because he was convinced, because he was pressured. The cleric didn't do this because he one day woke up and he said, well, actually, Nelson Mandela is a good guy. The cleric did this because he had no choice. It was over. And when we look at the state of Israel in a, more, in a critical way, I think it's quite clear that it's on its way out. And when we talk, when I talk, and I see many, many activists who are very active with the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, and they say two things. Number one, the situation here is far worse for Palestinians than it was for black in South Africa, in many ways. And the second thing is <clears throat> that it's changing and moving towards, it, towards its end much more rapidly than apartheid did in South Africa. In other words, the effects of the BDS and so on are much more... Uh, effective now than they were uh, against South Africa. So, <clears throat> again, this is now what Israelis are learning in school. Israelis are learning, you know, my sister just came out with a book about, it actually came out about the same time my book came out. It's called uh, Palestine Israeli School Books. And, she, and she's an educator. She teaches at the uh, David Yelin uh, Teachers College, part of the Hebrew University. And it demonstrates clearly that the Israeli education system is a racist education system that follows the exact same models as other racist education systems around the world. In other words, it's not racist in nuance. It's not that you have an anecdote here and there that's racist. It is systemically racist. And when we look at how young people vote, look at who they elected. Bennett, Naftali Bennett. Uh, this other guy, Lapid, and look at who became prime minister. And look at who's the foreman. I mean, look at these people. And many young people voted. This is these are the, this is the new generation. So this, I think, I think there's, I think we'd be, we would be, uh, it would be foolish to try to find hope among Israelis. I mean, there are many Israeli activists, wonderful Israeli activists. Don't get me wrong, but that's not where it's coming from. It's going to come as a result of the Palestinian persistence and as a result of pressure from the outside. And that's how it's going to happen. You know, Israelis do not want to hear anything that is outside of the Zionist parameter. They don't want to hear, they want to discuss anything that is, that is anti-Zionist. Well, fine, don't. But one day they will wake up and there will be an Israeli prime minister who makes that statement, and then there will be elections, and there may well be a Palestinian prime minister. And they may well, and their children may well have to go to school with Palestinian children. And they're going to realize that they're much better off. Not only the Palestinians are going to be better off, but they're going to be better off. Without the wall, without this militant society, uh, without this insane, irrational fear against a, a, a mythic enemy that doesn't exist. A mythic threat that doesn't exist. The only threat to Israel by Palestinians is one of legitimacy, which is why Israel and Netanyahu are jumping up and down, wanting to be recognized, recognized, recognized as Jews, Jews, Jews. You know, they jump up and down because they know that the Palestinians, the threat of Gaza and the threat of the Palestinian existence is to the legitimacy of the state of Israel. So this is the issue. In terms of what's possible or not possible, um, and I know that's kind of the second part of your question statement, who knows what's possible or not possible? Well, you know, none of us are prophets, so we'll have to wait and see. But let's meet in 10 years and see what happens. But your question was how long, how long I think this can last. I don't think this can last, I don't think this can last more than 10 years. I'll give you, I'll give you, <clears throat> here's an example, okay? I think you all know, there are many Palestinian doctors in Israeli hospitals. Israel needs doctors. A cousin of mine happens to be a surgeon at Hadassah Hospital. He, happens, he said that some of the best surgeons are the Palestinian surgeons. Fair enough. Israel needs doctors. Palestinians are good surgeons. It works. About a year ago, when I was here, my mother had surgery at Hadassah Hospital. The anesthesiologist, the surgeon, and half the nurses were Palestinian. In other words, they, need, they have the skills, they need the job, 
they need they have the need for skilled these, these pe people with these skills, right? But that very surgeon, and I, and this is not going to be any news to any of you here, that very surgeon that treated my mother so well, if he needs to go to a conference and fly out of Tel Aviv Airport, or take his family on vacation and fly out of Tel Aviv Airport, you know very well that he's going to be held there for probably four or five hours and terrorized by these 22-year-old Israeli security officers. These arrogant, patronizing, racist young Israelis that think they have the right to treat an older lady or gentleman who could be their own father like a criminal. Besides being morally repugnant, this is not sustainable. It wouldn't be sustainable even if this was like South Africa where you have millions of uneducated poor people. This is not the reality here. And so I don't see this lasting any more than 10 years. But we'll meet again and we'll talk. Thank you. Um, in terms of the race, I think when the Zionists came about with their ideology, one of, they, had, they did several things. First of all, they invented this idea that Jews are a race or a nation. Even though we well know that many of the larger Jewish communities around the world are there as a result of, of uh, uh, conversion. Not because they are the children of the you know, ancient Hebrews. In fact, there's not a single Israeli that can, or Jew that can you know, trace their roots back to the ancient Hebrews. But this was the Zionist claim, that we, the Jews today, are the descendants of the ancient Hebrews. The Bible is our history book. The Old Testament is our history book. So there was a David, there was a Goliath, there was a Samson, there was everything. Even though there is no historical proof at all that any of these things existed. This is all faith-based. But they turned it into a history. So now we have a nation, we have a history book, and we have a country. And of course, especially the early Zionists, because they were white, because they didn't look like Jews, I mean, they were secular people, they were highly educated doctors and physicists and so on, when they went and spoke in England and in America and other places, people said, well, we can talk to these people, look, they're white, they drink tea, they're civilized, we can discuss this. Why not allow them to colonize this Arab land who nobody cares about anyway? So this is, and today's, of course, today's APAC and today's Israeli lobby are their descendants, which is why they're so effective. They've been doing this for 80, 90 years. Um, so again, this whole idea that Jews are a nation, Jews are, it's, 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 it's a myth, it's mythology. There is no proof, there is no historical proof, there is no evidence, <coughs> quite the opposite. The evidence points the other way, you know. But this is the entire Zionist story. And if we're talking about this, I'll just say, well, I'll stand up, I see people in the back, can't see. Another, another aspect of the Zionist story that I think has to be refuted is, first of all, what you said, that it's really not a race, it's not a nation. Jews are Yemenites, Jews are Moroccans, Jews are Iraqis, Jews are Poles, and so on. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> but most Jews haven't accepted this. Most Jews have not accepted that this is their homeland. Most Jews have not accepted Zionism. I mean, it took the Zionists a lot of hard work to get the Jews that are here, are here, and many of it was here by all kinds of manipulations and, and, and creating a reality where they had no other choice. But nothing, nothing is more convincing of the absurdity of this idea that Jews need their own state more than this. After World War II, out of two million Jewish refugees and in camps in Europe, the very survivors of the Holocaust, the very survivors of the horrors of the Nazis, less than 10% came here. And many of the ones that did come here were disgusted and left because of how they were treated. The vast majority of the Jewish survivors of the Holocaust are not Zionists. They went to other places. So when people say, how could these people now do this? It's not the same people. The crimes of Zionism are not committed by Holocaust survivors. These are different Jews. They all happen to be Jews, perhaps, but these are different people. 
And the very Jews who suffered, who supposedly Israel needs to be their haven, said, we don't want this. We're not talking about half or a third. We're talking about the vast majority, close to 90%. What more convincing evidence do we need that this whole idea of a Jewish state and this whole Zionism thing is an unjustified, racist, colonialist ideology in practice? So, that's kind of a longer uh, answer to your question. <clears throat> Another question, possibly? You have hands? That's another question. I'm sure you can. Yeah. Let's go ahead, please. Okay. Um, thank you for answering my first question. I feel silly. Now let me ask the second question. If you can, it, maybe it's a yes or no question, or maybe if you can elaborate, are you working with any people that can force this um, chain, this end to Zionism? Are you consulting with, or is, is it top secret? Or, <laughs> it sounds wonderful, and I agree with it whole, you know, wholeheartedly. <laughs> is it real? Okay. <laughs> okay. Is that it? A couple more questions? Yes, please. Oh, yes, a couple more, yeah. Well, again, thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, my question is, and, and please take this in the best way possible. Um, why did you choose to come here and present this material to people here? Um, I'm saying that because I'm pretty, I'm one of the youngest adults here, uh, and I've been you know, fed this all my life. Uh, why did you choose to come here and, and kind of say the story that maybe most of us know? Uh, okay, we have the gentleman at the back, and I'll come back to you. How do you think Israel can maintain its identity as a Jewish state, considering that the current majority are not Jewish per se, and also most of the immigrants are not Jewish? There's a lot from Ethiopia, a lot from Europe. So how can it maintain its Jewish identity over time, and whether it's losing it or not? Uh, do you usually give such speeches inside Israel to Jewish communities? And if so, uh, what kind of impact does it have? Okay. Okay. Tough questions. Um, well, am I working with people? I don't work with any. I mean. I, I am working with people. When you talk about the BDS, you know, then I do everything I can to support the BDS. When we're talking about um, student groups in the United States on campuses, you know, of course I'm working with them. The churches, uh, everybody and anybody. And like I said, there is an effort. I, I think it's, all, when you take it, if you, if you step back and take a look at it, it almost looks like a global intifada. Because you've got all these different aspects happening uh, abroad, and then you've got the popular resistance, which I come and participate in as much as I can. Uh, when I'm here. Um, so in that regard, I do. I don't think, you know, so in that regard, of course I do, uh, as much as I can. I'm not, certainly not the only one. I'm certainly not the most important one. Um, most of the real, you know, I may be a spokesman or anything, or, or if anything, but most of the work is done by others, others who, are, who work very hard on the ground in all of these different areas. So young, Palest young students on campuses, and by the way, in, in the, in the uh, peace and justice groups, and the pro-Palestinian groups that I see in the U.S. and Canada particularly, you see many Jewish participate. Jews participate. So they don't come up and say, we are Jewish, we are Jewish. They say, we are, I'm a person and I support this cause. So they don't have that impact of like a Jewish community. They are just human beings who, who see this issue in, in the right light and they happen to be Jews. But I see this in a lot of places, that many, many Jews who participate in the pro-Palestinian uh, cause. Um, so they do the work on the ground, and they have to fight with the school administration, and they have to combat all the propaganda from the Israeli pro-Israeli groups, and they fight a really tough fight. And then, of course, they'll build a wall and checkpoints on campus and things like this. Uh, same thing with the churches. Yeah. A lot of the churches that are pro-Palestinian now. I mean, they do similar things. They do a lot of hard work, and not to mention the Palestinians here are doing the work, the, you know, the the, the, the weekly uh, marches and protests and. and and the blogging and all the other stuff that is being done here uh, to get the word out, and of course they're the ones who end up in jail and, and so on. Um, so I, I, I work and support all of them in, in, in whatever capacity I can. Uh, but there's no secret, I think all the stuff is out there. Not only is it not a secret, but I think five years ago all of this stuff was not even on the radar. 
Today, and again, I talk mostly about the United States, but um, it's hit a point where it's on the radar screens. So Israel is pouring millions of dollars to fight this, and they're losing. They're spending millions of dollars to combat BDS, millions of dollars to combat the pro-Palestinian movement. They're pouring, I don't know how many millions of dollars, just, to, just with tear gas and, 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 and bullets to, to fight the nonviolent resistance, the marches and putting up more signs and more checkpoints. And every time you see there's a new sign warning Israelis about going to the villages, you know, we all know what villages, they don't mention them, but those villages, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> so they're spending money on this and they're losing, which I think is a good thing. Um, <clears throat> why tell my story in Ramallah? Well, you know, we, Mahmoud and I talked about this and, you know, I gave this lecture in other places. Um, and we thought, you know, we'd come and do it and, and do this here. But I think I think your question is part of a bigger question, and that is, you know, why why preach the choir? And you're right; many people here know what I've said and know more. Um, but I do still think there's value in that, and I'll tell you why. I think. There's a lot of things that I say that people think but are either afraid or feel they can't say. So, me saying it will hopefully encourage them to repeat it. Um, in many cases, people who are here for the right reasons, but maybe they, and I'm not talking about Palestinians, I'm talking about you know, people who are from around the world, but perhaps don't have a clear picture because they hear all the different stories and they go to Israel and they see all these nice Israelis and they see what a nice place it is and they come here and they see these nice Palestinians and how do you make sense of all of it? So it's nice to have it compact like that. And they, again, these are, this, this is, these are things that people tell me. Um, and a lot of people are... are I'm sorry? Sorry to interrupt you, but it's also important for Palestinians to hear that there are other voices in Israel that exactly. they don't all feel under the same program. Yes, that there is an Israel. And, and I hear this all the time, that yeah. people come and say, well, we didn't know that there are Israelis who talk like this. Yeah. Um, and many Palestinians do know, but again, many people don't know. And Palestinians, not only Palestinians, uh, you know, people who come here, internationals that come here either to support or to work or whatever the case may be. Um, so I try, to, I try to, to really paint the picture in the clearest possible way. Away from this idea of peace talks and more towards the idea of a, of a popular struggle towards freedom and democracy. You know what I mean? Um, and then many people are kind of on the fence. You know, what is the right thing to do? Is it okay to, is it all Zionism or is it just the settlers? Is BDS something we should impose only on settlement products or on all of Israel? You know, all these kinds of questions that people are just not clear about and it's really quite impossible to be clear about unless you spend all your life dealing with it. And most people don't. So I think that's the value. Um, now, at the same time, and that's your question, <coughs> do I do there, are, there is no Israeli audience that wants to hear this. In fact, it's quite a funny story. Last time I was here, I got a message from an Israeli in Tel Aviv. He said, would you be willing to come and speak in Tel Aviv? I said, sure. Is there an audience? And he said, well, let me see if I can work something together. I mean, how many do you need? I said, I don't care. Five people, four people, ten people, whatever. You know, if you want to talk, we can sit in somebody's living room. I don't care. So a few days later, <laughs> a few days later he sent me a message. He said, everybody's saying, Miko who? <laughs> that's the response he's getting. I mean, who's this guy and why do we need to listen to him? And of course, if they take <clears throat> two minutes to Google my name, you know, anti-Zionist comes up probably first, you know. Tear down the wall, tear down Zionist, all this kind of stuff. So they don't want to hear this. You know, they don't want to hear this. Um, and like I said, I don't think it's necessarily my job or anybody's job to convince them. You know, if people choose to keep their head in the sand and completely be oblivious to what goes around them, you know, that's their problem. And one day they're gonna, somebody's going to yank their head out of the sand and say, hey, the world's changed. And that's just going to be the reality. Um, it's the same thing in America. You know, the Zionist communities don't invite me. <clears throat> in America, people say, well, does the Jewish community invite me? <clears throat> There's no such thing as a Jewish community. Certainly not in America. There's no such thing as a Jewish community. There are hundreds of different Jewish communities. You've got the Orthodox, the ultra-Orthodox, the Zionist Orthodox, and the non-Zionist Orthodox. And that's just the Orthodox. <laughs> now you've got the non-secular, the, the non-Orthodox Jews. And then you've got the, large, the larger portion of them don't really care about Israel one way or the other. 
you probably couldn't find it on a map. Among the smaller percentage that cares about this place, some people are totally Zionist and they send their kids on birthright and all this nonsense, and some people, you know, are, do what I do. So you've got the whole range. So there's no such thing as a Zionist, you know, or, or there's no such thing as a Jewish community. But again, if those Zionists don't want to hear this from me, I don't care. They're going to hear this one way or another one day from somebody. You know, when they wake up in the morning, and like I said, the prisoners are free, and uh, Palestinians uh, get to participate in elections like, like everybody else. And this is a point that came up yesterday when I was talking to some friends <clears throat> um, about the idea of the one state. And I think many people think that what, when I talk about a single democracy, we're talking about Palestinians becoming Israelis. I think that would be a terrible thing. I think that is, that is absurd. That is not the idea. I mean, maybe that's Naftali Bennett's idea or one of those people. But that is not what we're talking about. We're not talking about making everybody Israelis. We're talking about canceling this entire apartheid system and then creating a new, citizen, a, new, a new kind of citizenship, a new kind of reality. That's what the struggle is for. So I think it's important to make that absolutely clear. We're not talking about everybody becoming uh, third-class citizens as Israelis. We're talking about everybody becoming Ezra citizens. Plan. If that's what they choose to call it, that's fine. <laughs> it's it's kind of idea. You know. <laughs> yes, that's right. It's but it would be nice if you can talk to uh, school children and university students in Israel. It would be very nice. I agree. I mean, I would never say no. Still fresh, you know, I would never say no. I agree. You know, and Bassam here talks to he goes into talk, talk talks to Israeli school children, and he talks to Israelis, you know, a lot more than I do, yeah. or more. I don't at all. So he does that kind of work, and does some great, great important work. And by the way, Bassam and Jamal are both great friends of mine. They're featured in my book uh, because they were very generous and allowed me to tell their story about you know the, about the prisoners and so on. So they enlightened me and were my teachers on this entire issue, opened my, my eyes and my understanding of, of, of that aspect, of this really important aspect of the Palestinian issue. So I'm grateful that you know, you're my friends and that you're here, both of you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so before we round up, maybe we can do one more round yeah, of questions so if we have. Okay, I see mm -hmm. there's a hand up. <clears throat> um, when you spoke in Ramola, I guess it was about a year ago, I can't remember exactly now, um, Someone asked you about getting the book translated into Hebrew, and yes. you had no interest in it, I think, at that time. Um, is it being translated into Hebrew? Do you, are you in favor of having it translated? Or do you think it would have a, an effect of moving us closer to that date when... You have no idea how happy I have asked that question. I'll tell you why in just a second. I'm very glad you asked that question. Right. Is there anything else or is that it? <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Thank you for that, sir. My question is, uh, did you manage to convince your brother-in-law that the two-state solution is vanished? <laughs> okay. Any more questions? All right. You obviously read the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's... Um, by the way, speaking about translation, the, the thing that I'm very pleased about is that the Arabic translation just came out about a month ago, like Mahmoud was saying. And it's, I think it's even, uh, I don't have a copy, but um, they sent me just a couple and, you know, but it will be, it's, it's, it was published in Beirut by a Lebanese uh, publisher. It's a beautiful production, it's a very nice book. In fact, I think it's a better quality book than, in terms of the production than, uh, than the English one. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bigger, it's more, anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a bigger, you know, kind of a big, uh, important publisher. It was translated by a Palestinian uh, from Gaza, Dr. Mahmoud Hirthani, who's a friend of mine. And so I'm very pleased about that as well. He did a great job. So it's, it's, it will be available, but I think it's already maybe available online. In terms of the Hebrew translation, um, it's not that I'm not interested. I, I, I'd be very glad if it was translated, and uh, a good friend of mine here is trying to convince her to, to, to translate it because she's a great writer and a great activist. Now, yeah, so. I'm, I'm, I'm pushing her as hard as I can to get started and then, and then present it. But of course, the issue is not translating, the issue is getting it published. Yeah. We can work on get it translated. So we're in the process of, 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 of doing that, you know, of, of getting it done. And inshallah, we'll, we'll, we'll have a Hebrew translation and see what happens. You know, see, they'll either burn it or read it. We'll see. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know if I convinced them or not, but uh, you may have an opportunity. I mean, he speaks all over the place. In fact, he and Bassam speak together. 
um, quite a lot, and you might, you, you should, you need to ask him that question. It's something that's, that's, you know, I don't want to speak for him. Um, but I'm glad you read the book, and I think, I, I think, the, you know, the last chapter, what we're talking about is the last chapter of the book, which is called One State, Two State, Three States, and that's the conversation between myself, my brother, and Arami about this issue. And it's really a discussion, and it's a true discussion, in other words, I condense it in one chapter, but these are all things that we actually, you know, it's a conversation we actually have, and we've been having since probably I was 12 years old, um, <clears throat> about this whole idea of Zionism and, and you know, and, and the Jewish state and so on and so forth, and, and his reaction to my becoming an anti-Zionist and publishing anti-Zionist point of view and speaking an anti-Zionist point of view. Um, but I'll let you maybe come to a future lecture that he and Bassam, you know, uh, have and then ask him. I think it'll probably be better. All right, thank you all very much. Thanks, all dear audience, and thank for the French and German culture center for hosting us tonight. If you need more copies of the book, it's there. Nico will be here signing them. Have a lovely evening.